A shakeup at NASA because of political considerations in the Trump administration. I'm Scott Ott and this is Bill Whittle now. And Bill, uh, William Gerstenmeyer, NASA's head of human exploration, who's been with the agency, I think 42 years, was just fired by Jim Bridenstine, the former legislator who was picked by President Trump to run the space agency. Um, immediately, criticism began to rain down on the Trump administration as well as Bridenstine. Bridenstine, by the way, said he was entirely accountable for that decision. However, uh, behind the scenes, people in the space industry are saying that uh, that Trump and, and Vice President Mike Pence were both getting intensely dissatisfied with the fact that NASA is not anywhere near going to the moon, despite the fact that Pence announced in March that he'd shortened the goal for getting there to 2024. Uh, Bill, do you think it's wise when you're trying to land on the moon again to get rid of the guy who has all the institutional knowledge? For those of you who have not heard, I've, I just recorded a um, four-part series on, it's called Apollo 11, what we saw, but basically with four hours, almost five hours, I got a chance to do the entire space race from Chinese-assisted arrows uh, in 200 BC to um, X, to SpaceX landing the twin boosters on the Falcon Heavy launch. So this is a subject I'm familiar with. I thought you might like it. Between 1960, end of 1961, when we flew Alan Shepard in a suborbital flight, a little capsule, sent him up straight up, brought back down again, 15 minute flight, 15 minute flight. From that point in 1961 until, uh, until uh, July 20th, 1969, we went through three complete programs using different hardware. We used the Redstone, the Atlas, the Titan Booster, the Saturn I, the Saturn I B, the Little Joe, and the Saturn V. Uh, and we made quite a bit of progress, uh, to say the least, in eight years. Since that time, and this is not an exaggeration, since the end of the Apollo era, NASA has flown the same flight path that John Glenn flew in 1962. In 1962, in, in seven years, we went from orbiting the Earth in low Earth orbit to landing on the moon. And in the last, what is it now since we left, uh, I wanna say it's probably 47 years. In the last 47 years, we have retraced John Glenn's steps of circling the earth in low earth orbit and of course that stopped in when was uh, the last shuttle flight is it 11 2011 12 something like that the you know i i have said this many times scotty i'm a space age kid i'm an apollo kid i grew up in the space age and my respect and love for nasa is, was so strong that i had the logo tattooed on the inside of my skin kind of thing and I drew that NASA vector, doodled it out thousands of times. So my reaction to what NASA has become is very much like a long and drawn out divorce process from somebody you deeply love. Back in March, Bill, um, Vice President Mike uh, Pence said that, um, that we were going to update the goal of putting a man on the moon by 2028 to 2024. And he essentially put the NASA leadership on notice saying if they couldn't do that, they'd be held accountable as well as the industry, the space industry. And here's what he said, NASA must transform itself into a leaner, more accountable, more agile organization if NASA is not currently capable of landing American astronauts on the moon in five years, we need to change the organization, not the mission. Hallelujah. So you think NASA's this... become so high to bound and bureaucratic. Oh my that... God, man. Oh my God. He's been he's been head of human space flight for how long did you say? 42 years? I don't think he's been in that position for 42 years, but he's been with NASA for about 42 years. So basically, he has either been in the agency or presided over the loss of two generations of time. 40 years of dropped balls. That's what, that's what he basically uh, was, was overseeing. And now, somehow firing him after 42 years of this incompetence is, is, um, is, is uh, somehow unreasonable. But the, the, the fired, loss of institutional the, knowledge means fired, nothing to you? I would have fired the entire agency, all of them. 
All of them. So that's actually one of my questions, Bill. Why doesn't Trump say that? Basically, look, there's no way that a government bureaucracy that's been uh, so bollocked up for 50 years is going to possibly be able to have the new energy that the JFK era agency had. So why not just scrub the whole thing, have a cabinet level secretary for NASA whose main job is to hire four other people who then hire private industry to build the rockets and put man on the moon? Well, this is a different question. It's an interesting question. And the question is whether or not NASA should be in the space transportation business. And every day that goes by, I'm inclined to think more and more that they should not. That the role for NASA, which used to be, uh, NASA evolved from NACA, the National Aeronautics National Aeronautical Council uh, on Aviation, I think it was. No, anyway, NACA was a sort of an aviation-based uh, agency prior to NASA. And NACA was essentially uh, an agency that did pure research onto things like, um, you know, airfoil shapes and so on. NASA basically was put together in order to make a political objective in a war with the Soviet Union, and that was they were put together to accomplish a mission that used, as I say in the in the program, this this Apollo project, including Jiminy and Mercury, was the use of our best missiles, our best engineers, our best test pilots. We had aircraft carriers, helicopters involved. We had radar stations all around the world. It, it was a war that was fought without warheads actually being exploded. And for that reason, because it was essentially a military type operation, NASA was necessary to coordinate the enormous numbers of subcontractors needed to get all of these pieces in the same place at the same time. But now, and for a long time now, People I know in private space have said that the that, that NASA's job is to make sure that nobody gets into space. That well, they, NASA regu regulates this activity so strongly that nobody can clear the bar. And for an agency that that basically went in circles for 40 years and has not had the ability to put men into orbit for six, seven years now, the United States of America as a government cannot put people into space. We cannot get into low Earth orbit at all, unless we're willing to take a risk with Elon Musk. And I don't think it's much of a risk, actually. As if to so, echo your point, Bill, uh, the space launch system or SLS that NASA has been working on for about a decade has yet mm -hmm. to fly. The government accountability office has found that the cost of the rocket has grown by 30%. The first launch was expected in 2017. It might not happen until mid 2021 at this point. Meanwhile, NASA is continuing to pay performance bonuses, award fees to Boeing for scoring high on performance evaluation, tens of millions of dollars. Fire them all. Fire them all. NASA has become a standing army of bureaucrats. The NASA that I got to love, and, and by the way, when I say that I got to love, NASA strikes an incredibly warm chord in the heart of any American who's over the age of 40 or 50. Because what NASA accomplished when NASA was started was nothing less of astonishing. But it was a government program to put together a project and it was not it was not ever really going to be an ongoing sustainable thing but the nasa of of the of the apollo 11 moon landings certainly was not the nasa of the challenger explosion which was 1987 where where engineers from Morton Thiokol, the people who made the boosters, were honest to God running through the facility on that morning saying, you cannot launch this rocket, this, this, this shuttle mission, you cannot launch it. It's too cold. You're going to lose the entire crew. Well, we've had burns through before and it didn't destroy the crew and, you know, and there's pressure to get the first teacher in space. So what could possibly go wrong? Then the same thing happened in 2002. Foam hits the leading edge of the, of the, of the Columbia, punches a hole in it. We lose seven astronauts. And NASA says, well, that's funny because we've had the orbiters been struck by foam for, I don't know, 15 times now, something like that, ever since we went to the ecologically friendly adhesive so that the foam actually starts coming off the tank now and nothing ever happened before. That's not NASA. That's not that, that and, and for this agency, by the way, and this, and this is the most important point, NASA's budget today in terms of real dollars is the same or maybe even higher than it was when they were, you know, actually flying men into space and had a fleet of four space shuttles. Don't you find that odd? Don't you find it odd that the, that the National Aeronautics and Space Administration has the same amount of money today as it did when it had to cycle four orbiters and make 
I don't know what the total record for a shuttle launch year was. You think I would know that? Is probably going to guess it's probably around seven or eight, maybe that high. Um, so, so they have become what the, look NASA is the EPA of outer space. It was something that when it when it was created had a mission. Uh, when the EPA was created, this country had mercury in all of the waters. The Cayuga River uh, in Cleveland caught fire. The Great Lakes were sterile bodies of, 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 you know, of poisoned water. And the EPA came in and basically cleaned this mess up. And now, after a few years or 10 years, what the EPA did was astonishing. And the mission is over. And the EPA doesn't go away. Now the EPA's job is to make sure that nobody opens a business because nobody who's working for the government is ever fired, Scott. They become, they, they become these immor immortal, they're like, they're like, uh, they're like a, like a, like a cancer um, uh, tissue that, you know, that, that's being grown in a lab. And, and so I don't even, I don't, I'm not convinced that NASA should be in the business of putting people into space as an agency. I think NASA should probably be doing things like the, um, uh, the robotic exploration that we do that needs to be coordinated. That's that's superb. It's absolutely superb. Um, but most of that is done by either the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or lately John Hopkins. Um, so what you've got is this giant bureaucracy that for 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 45 years has done nothing, nothing. And and it this this kind of action should have happened by certainly after Challenger in 1986, I would have gone through the entire agency. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have fired technicians, but I would have fired every single manager or administrator that was anywhere in the loop on the launch of, of Challenger on that morning in January of 86. Bill, at the time when uh, President Trump made his uh, nominee public for uh, to run the space agency, Jim Bridenstein, few people looked at him as more than just kind of a fire-breathing conservative, relative rookie, uh, even in the political business. Um, I saw him speak once at a red state gathering, and when I heard that he was nominated to run NASA, I was gobsmacked at that. Um, and yet now he has come in, and at least his position positioning himself as the guy who is willing to chop out 42 years of institutional knowledge and one of the top leaders who was respected in Congress and respected at other space agencies around the world and remake this agency. Uh, let me ask you, how many more months do you give him in that job? Given the way that the Democrats have, as a party, positioned their ship directly you know, like uh, centered on the reef where the Democrats are either going to get the, the, the rational vote of the working class or they're going to get the reactionary, uh, the radical vote of the social justice warriors, but not both. I think right now, as we sit here in, in uh, July of 2019, I think the chance of Donald Trump getting reelected is strong. If Donald Trump is reelected, then this gentleman will have five years to accomplish the mission that was given to him by the vice president. This mission is easily accomplishable, easily, but it is not easily accomplishable with the other half of this of this um, evil twin set. And that is uh, companies that, again, I used to respect and admire and that I still respect and admire for their actual technical skill. Companies like Lockheed and Boeing and Northrop and, and, and all the rest of these guys. Um, I admire the ability for them to make things like the F-35 and so on, but as as corporate entities as businesses they're repulsive and the and the the manner at which we buy hardware from these guys the american people buys hardware through the defense department is criminal it's simply shocking basically it's cost plus in other words they say well it's going to cost this and we say okay fine 15 billion dollars no problem but also by the way um if if we have cost overruns then you'll have to pay those as well Sure, no problem, what could happen? So what have you got now? You've got to go take Boeing just as one example of all of them. Boeing is gonna get a package of money and the more they delay and the more problems that come up, the more money they get. I'm willing to bet that the people of Boeing would say that that SLS system would have been airborne and orbiting the earth and beyond in three to five years if it hadn't been for the bureaucrats in government. They are the bureaucrats in government. The, the people at Boeing who are making the deals with, with, with NASA 
are the same exact kind of people are on the other side of the table. These are bureaucrats, managers, and administrators. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's no engineers in, in this loop. Let me give you two quick examples of, ex, of, of companies that I know well, okay, well. One from the inside and one from the outside. The company I know well from the inside is Scaled Composites, which is Burt Rutan's uh, company, which he retired from several years ago. Burt Rutan is a, is, a, is a genius. He's an absolute, absolute aerodynamic genius. And because his company was based around his genius, when Burt Rutan had decided in, in association with the rest of the people in the company that we need to build an aircraft to do this, that aircraft got built in three, four months. And they would fly something, and then they'd test it, and then they'd make changes, and they'd fly the, the uh, revised model later that day. That was because of Burt Rutan's leadership. The company I don't know from the inside, but I know from the outside is, is SpaceX. And I understand a lot of conservatives have problems with SpaceX taking government subsidies. Put that aside for a second. The reason that I have had renewed hope in America's space program is very simple. The reason that I think we have a chance to go to the moon is because the vehicle that is used to recover first stage boosters returning from near orbit to be used again, this remote controlled barge in the middle of the Atlantic, its official name is, of course I still love you. And I'm not joking. A company who does that is going to go to Mars. A company that will launch, when, when you're testing the launch of a new booster, you obviously don't want to put people in it. You, you just want to make sure it can lift the, the, the payload that it's supposed to lift. So you could frankly fill it with cement, whatever you want to do. But this is a really important point, Scott. So when Falcon Heavy launched, they needed to put some weight up there to make sure this thing could carry the weight. So what they did was they put a red sports car, a red sports car built by the same guy who built the rocket, by the way. And in it, they put a, a they put an astronaut in a brand new suit. Didn't look like a spacesuit. Looked two generations out of a spacesuit, which is what they would look like now if NASA had been doing their job. A mannequin of an astronaut. Well, yes. Sorry, beg your pardon. Yes. Um, and so um, and so he's driving this car with his elbow on the shoulder. We're getting live HD 4K footage from orbit of this red Tesla Roadster slowly orbiting. David Bowie music is playing, although it's not playing to the to the to the guy in the in the um, in the sports car because there's no air for the sound to travel through. But on the center console, on the navigational console, somebody had taped up a sign that said, "Don't panic." Don't panic is the is the catchphrase for um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and and. And here's my point. This is not a trivial point. This is, the, this is the entire key point to why this is gonna work and why NASA's not. The idea that Boeing would do something like that is inconceivable. It is inconceivable that Boeing would do something that much fun, that smart politically, that smart um, in terms of publicity. And the reason that it is inconceivable that Boeing would do that is because nobody is in charge of Boeing. Boeing is an enormous, enormous, enormous company. And I'm sure there is obviously a, a chairman of the board, but Boeing is run by, by administrators and boards and subcommittees and all the rest of it. Elon Musk, on the other hand, can say, you know what would be fun? It'd be kind of cool if we just put a Tesla road strip there. Why don't we just do that? Well, in yeah, a sense, a Boeing idea. is, it, the people at Boeing are concerned with keeping their jobs. The people at uh, SpaceX are concerned with going to Mars. The, the people at Boeing are concerned with keeping their jobs. And the problem with the people at SpaceX is they can't hire enough good people fast enough. And that is because SpaceX belongs to a person. It's not done by one person. There's an army of people there, but it is under the, the it is under the control, the guide, the vision is a better word, of one person who has the authority to make this happen. That's why Apple products, when the iPhone and the iMac and stuff came out, when Steve Jobs had the ability to go into a room full of people and say, I want a phone and I want it to be a phone and I want it to be a, a camera and I want it to be a mini computer. And all of his team says, that's, sir, that's just not possible. Steve Jobs can say, if you think it's impossible, you're fired. If you think you can figure out a way to do it, you're, you're hired in, for, until next week. So the people who were responsible for building the iPhone said it was impossible. And Steve Jobs said, I don't care what you think. I don't care. And, I, and I'm willing to bet, I'm willing to agree with you that it's impossible right now. So let's make it possible. 
And if you don't, well, then we'll find somebody who will. And the next thing you know, we have a, a, a world changing technology because one person had the vision. And I'll close by saying this, Boeing is an enormous, enormous, enormous company, but it's named after a guy named Boeing. And McDonnell Douglas was named after guys named McDonald and Donald Douglas. And uh, and Grumman was named after a guy named Grumman. And Northrop was named after a guy named Northrop. And Hughes was named after a guy named Hughes. And on and on and on, Cessna, Lear, all of these companies were owned by individuals. And at the beginning of the age, golden age of aviation, these individual men took control of these companies, didn't take control of them, they grew the company based on their vision and when Howard Hughes decides he wants to make the world's largest flying boat and everybody in the universe tells him that this is an absolute folly, there's no need for it, you haven't got the engines for it, Howard Hughes had the ability to go ahead and make the Hercules and it turned out to be an enormous folly. It did. It was a complete folly. They called it the Spruce Goose. He flew it. He got, well, I don't even think he really technically, he got it off the ground, but he didn't get it out of ground effect. But in any event, the fact that, that, that Howard Hughes could do something that irrational meant that he had the power to do things that were rational and visionary. And the idea of, of a spruce goose today coming from uh, NASA or, for that matter, uh, 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 the ability to recover a booster. You know, Scotty, when you, when you think about this, you listen to, I, I mentioned this in the Apollo 11 program, I saw the moon landing in Central Park. I was, my dad was a hotel manager. I was in the Plaza Hotel um, at, at a suite and we had the windows open. And down in Central Park, there were 30 or 40,000 people watching the moon landing live on projection screens. And when Neil Armstrong went down that ladder, it was absolute silence. But once he stepped on the moon and said, small step, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, this roar came up out of Central Park and I wrote, that I have not heard that sound since then. And two days after I wrote it, before I shot it, I realized that's not true. I have heard that sound one time before. And the only other time I've heard the sound that came out of Central Park when we landed on the moon, it is exactly the same, precisely the same sound that you can hear right now if you go to YouTube and Google the first Falcon Heavy mission. Hmm. Because when these two boosters are coming down and they light, there's a cheer. The room's full of spectators, millennials who pulled this off. And these things are coming down and people are cheering and cheering and cheering. But when they actually land and the engine shut off and you see them both there in the center of their pads, that cheering goes up three octaves. And that sound is not just happiness or joy. That sound is excitement, passion, and, and ecstasy. And that is going to get us where we need to go. Um, so I think NASA, I personally, if it were me, if I was the director of NASA, I would simply, I would take the money that I'm spending from the government, I'd probably return half of it, and I would take the other half, and I would do some things. I would subsidize uh, SpaceX for a while. They're the only people that can get to our space station. You know, you got to pay people for the ride. It's a bus company. So I would pay SpaceX to get us to the space station that we built and that we can't get to anymore. And then I would take the rest of this money and I would be extraordinarily careful. I would not have this decision in the hands of administrators. I would have a team of engineers, scientists, and science fiction writers. And I would say to them, NASA's currently budgeted at $13 billion or whatever it is. I'm gonna give you guys the discretionary ability to spend $5 billion. You get to spend $5,000 million. Go find me companies that have two employees that are making something that no one's ever made before and then check out and make sure that these guys have the chops to do this and then put some money there and, and watch what happens. Yearning for the sound of American triumph, five days a week, By Bill Whittle God. now brings you Bill's analysis of breaking news of the day. Thanks to the members of BillWhittle.com who've made it all possible. If you'd like to join their ranks and hear more of this kind of noise, go to BillWhittle.com and click that Become a Member link. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members for making this happen.